dan kawan-kawan. Yes. Aku baru Alright, welcome everyone here. Great that you all uh, came to Bang. But also welcome everyone online. They are watching there. We have uh, people from across the globe joining us. So great also online. And this is also at the moment live stream on uh, all our social media. So the world is watching with us. So welcome to the International Conference for Youth in Agriculture. Welcome to the largest gathering of youth in agriculture. And uh, yeah, welcome to this real life conference after such a long time of not being able to do this. Uh, my name is Thomas, Thomas Westhoff. Uh, I'm the vice president of external relations of EIS Growth. Um, and you're one of your hosts of this event. In the coming days, you will be submerged in the latest scientific developments of cropping systems. And we will let our voices heard to make ICEA an unforgettable event and a landmark event for youth in agriculture. And along the way, we will broaden our scopes. But science first. The recent IPCC report has shown the world again what challenges our generation will face. And how crucial it is to adapt and mitigate our cropping systems to the challenge of climate change, but also other challenges, the rising population and rebalancing the relationship between mankind and nature. You have all one shared interest here, and I hope this event will spark new innovations and new connections to work on these challenges. From the seeds we plant, the techniques we use to grow our crops properly. And all the policies to make sure that the food on our plates are grown in a sustainable way, all these elements will pass by during ICEA. Leading experts from the University of Bonn are here, and which will tell, will tell us everything about how to become a good cropping scientist, how multifunctional cropping systems look like, but also how energy and food production can be coupled. But we uh, also will look into the world of digitalization and what small scale food factories are. Besides academia, you will also get the latest insights from pivotal players from the industry. Bayer will join us to, uh, together with the ATH Studio to tell you more about embedding resilience thinking in intensive arable systems. Well, Corona will give a speech on how they think smart farming looks like. In addition, other players will be here, such as the European Union. The European Union will tell you more about their farm to fork strategy and also the green goals they set themselves. But we will also get someone from the NGOs who will tell you how to move from policy from science to policy from the NGO CIAT. But academia, policy, NGOs, and industry, there is one crucial element missing here. And the second pillar are you, the young minds in agriculture. Our generation has gained more and more interest from policymakers, from industry over the last years. I've seen that myself. Last October, I went to together with, uh, with others here, other EIS members, and I saw that something is changing there. It was uh, for the first time that during the climate conference, there was a dedicated youth day. And youth is getting more and more on the agenda of all parties involved in our cropping system. So I think it's a crucial, crucial part that we are gathering here together uh, during this event and we'll make plans towards the future and we uh, make sure our voices will be heard. But let's stay critical about all the collaborations we start with academia, with businesses, because for a good collaboration, we need an equal playing field. And that is something that is often missing 
I see way too often good projects coming to me, but we can't implement it just because young people lack the resources to investment, but also lack the rights to land. So that is something we can also work on. What are the struggles we see as our generation of new farmers, of new researchers in agriculture, and how can we work to a more fair system and good collaborations with everyone? But also, what can you do about this in balance? There is also one thing where youth is very good at, and that is bringing parties together. Keep having a dialogue with everyone here, but also outside of your, of your bubble. Voice out your ideas and dare to look further. Yeah, as is trying to do this wherever we can. Some projects close to my heart that I want to showcase here today and tell you about are, for example, the Village Concert Projects where youth together with all kinds of parties and stakeholders are trying to change cropping systems bottom up, but also the competitions that we are having now. With the FAO, but also Wageningen University and Bayer, we're really trying to get competitions going where we can get investments in the pocket of youth to kickstart new ideas and get those in in investments going to new ideas for new people. Two developments that we have to keep extending and we have to keep having a dialogue by writing call to actions, attending conferences and recording podcasts. We have to spread the word about what young people are doing. Therefore, I'm also very happy that we have today the, uh, the winners from the Youth in Climate Brazil Agriculture Competition with us. We organize this competition together with the FAO, and they are coming from across the globe. We have people here from Costa Rica till Nepal. And that brings me to the third pillar and last pillar of this conference, looking beyond borders. We have at this conference, in this room at the moment, more than 30 nationalities together. And online, more than 70 nationalities have registered and are joining. So this is the perfect place to look, for, look further than your expertise, than your comfort zone, to learn about each other. So I'm happy you are all here today in Bonn and joining us online and try to inspire each other. All right, let's get ICEA starting now. Brace yourself for the latest scientific insights, interesting discussion and reflections on the role of youth in cropping systems and let's push boundaries in this special international setting. Let this conference be the stage to think globally, but act globally. Thank you. All right, we'll now move on to the next speaker. This is Mr. Uda Dana, he's Deputy Director in the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment of the FAO. Uh, he has worked in the past for UNEP, the British government and the French government, and he is joining us from online. Um, so if he is there in the call, uh, Pradina, you can showcase him. Yes, I am here. Um, thank you very much for um, this invitation. Uh, let me welcome everyone. Um, uh, please just confirm that you can hear me first before I continue. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, well, thank you very much again for, for this opportunity. Um, and it's my great pleasure to, to welcome everyone today. Um, to this international conference uh, for youth in, in agriculture. Um, this is not only the first day of the conference, obviously, but it is also the first day of this joint FAO, International Association of Students in Agricultural and Related Science Youth for Green and Climate Resilient Agriculture uh, Programme. Um, let me start by congratulating the eight successful applicants who came a long way, obviously, who are with us here today and managed to stand out amongst the, the many other applicants who 
presented themselves to, to this program. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we cover uh, a wide range of um, locations from Democratic Republic of Congo, Zero. Nepal, Indonesia, India, Zambia, Kenya, Ghana, and Costa Rica. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, the, the, you know, the, this, this is really an important program for us that involves the youth. The youth agenda has been um, rising up in the last few years in making really the concerns and priorities focal and showing so much energy and commitment, particularly in dealing with the climate crisis. So through this program, what we hope really to help you with is to further develop your leadership skills so that you can successfully grow uh, a greener and more resilient, resilient agriculture. Um, so we really need your commitment, your input and expertise to change how we are currently interacting with the environment and with nature. I mean, we're putting so much pressure on the environment because of our lifestyle and the natural resources are not sustainable, unfortunately, in the way we are using them. We need to be more efficient. We need to be more uh, caring about the, the environment, about natural resources, about the climate, if we want to think beyond just the current generation, and we need to. So we really need your, your input, your, your thinking, uh, and it's impressive how young people lately yeah. are really raising their voices in, in, this, in this agenda. We have seen that at least recently at COP26 in Glasgow and also during the UN Food Systems Summit, where the youth presented impressive declarations that reflect their expectations of the futures and how they want to, to shape you know, the way forward. So obviously young people told the world on many occasions how they're hungry for change in changing the agri-food systems and how they want to be involved in, in the decision-making and also in the changes that affect their future. And they had a number of occasions where they expressed their commitment and their willingness to, to be part of, of this change. So it's really exciting to see young people um, are getting more organized and, and more committed um, through various international fora, such as the World Food um, Forum, where this year we can see the theme is healthy diets and healthy planet. And we really look forward to seeing this contribution to, to this movement. You know, the agri-food systems really need drastic changes because as I said earlier, we're putting too much pressure on the use of, of water, on the way we use food. In fact, we waste a lot of food. You know, today we have around 811 million people who go hungry every day. And on the other side, we have around 2 billion people who don't have, who are obese or, or, under, or overweight. And at the same time, we throw a lot of food away. We throw the third of food that is produced for human consumption. And that's responsible for around 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And when we waste that, obviously, we waste not just the food, but the water that went into producing it, the energy, the transport, the effort, etc. So this is really important that the change happens to make agri-food systems more efficient, more resilient to the impact of climate change and to shocks, shocks and um, um, pandemics like the, the one we, we live in at, at the moment. So what this International Conference for Youth in Agriculture offers really is space for young people. Um, so it is organized around this for you to share your thoughts, your views, your innovative ideas, what needs to happen. 
uh, at least in the lead up to COP27, which will be held in Sharm el-Sheikh in, in, in Egypt in November. So in the following three days, you know, we look forward to, to hearing about these ideas, to further define you, your ideas and discuss amongst yourselves what needs to happen. This is a call for action, really, of, um, you know, what, what change we, we need to, to see happening. How do we get there? How do we achieve it? So please drive forward this momentum, uh, because besides having discussions and dialogues and conferences, we obviously need solutions. This is the time where we reach a stage where we need to implement as many practical solutions as possible. Because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us repeatedly, and just last month they published their report on adaptation, that we are not doing enough. And the window of action and of opportunity is closing fast because we left it so late. So we really need to take this more seriously and come up with the solutions. I mean, a lot of solutions, we know them, we know what they are. We just need to replicate them fast and at larger scale. But this is the time also to be creative and to be innovative of what we need to put in place in terms of solutions that need to be applied urgently given the urgency of the current situation. We can't hear you anymore, unfortunately. We can't hear you. Sorry, your mic went. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. No, we can't hear you still. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Did you hear everything I said or not? No, the, the last minute was gone, unfortunately. Okay, well, I don't know what happened, unfortunately, but uh, apologies. I, I, I had my mic on, so something must have happened. Um, I'm, I'm coming to, to the end, really, and apologies if you didn't hear part of it. Um, so it's just the last minute you didn't hear, right? Yeah, the last minute. The last minute. Okay. Apologies about that. I was just really emphasizing the, the importance of the, the latest information from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and how we need to act fast, really, because we, we left it so late now and the window of opportunity of acting to apply solutions across the board is, is closing really fast. So um, I just wanted to finish by highlighting the, the, the urgency of the situation we, we are in with regard to the climate crisis and how it affects food security and will continue to affect it unless we, we really act and then and, and implement the, the solutions, particularly innovative solutions, and make sure that there is equity in access to affordable and sustainable food by, by everyone. So thank you again very much for this opportunity. I really wish you a successful conference and very much look forward to, to hearing from you today and throughout the conference as you develop your ideas and share experiences between among, uh, among cell, amongst yourselves. And looking forward to learning about your insight in, in your core for action, as I said, on the way to COP27 and, and beyond. So thank you again for this opportunity and I wish you really good luck in your conference. Back to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uda. And um, yeah, we, uh, we, we are really happy that we uh, work uh, together with, with the FAO on the competition and are uh, happy to share with you uh, our results, our call to action that we will write uh, during this, uh, this conference. 
And uh, yeah, I invite you also uh, to the closing ceremony to uh, yeah, to see where we uh, came up with. So yeah, thank you very much. Then we go uh, further to the uh, co-head of the Food and Agriculture Youth Institute of uh, EIS. Uh, Omar, our uh, old president of, of EIS, is now leading this uh, newly installed think tank of EIS. He has some, uh, some remarks for all of you. So uh, come here, Omar. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas. Hope you can hear me well. It is a great uh, pleasure to speak in, in front of such a diverse international conference for youth in agriculture. My name is Omar Hafez, and I'm born and raised in uh, Morocco. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of FAI, the Food and Agriculture Youth Institute, which is a new independent uh, committee. I think it's better if I take off my mask. Which is a new independent uh, committee that was created uh, within EAS, the International Association of Students in Agricultural and Related Sciences. Uh, the mission of this independent committee is to engage youth and students and EAS members in the food systems policy space and debate, focused on capacity building, research. So the youth out here uh, will be uh, bringing in scientific evidence, um, focusing on policy, recommending policies, and then implementing actions and projects. So that's the whole idea behind this Food and Agriculture Youth Institute. And I invite you all to join the workshop uh, at 8 p.m. today, um, where we will design our first uh, call to action on cropping systems for the future. So you're all invited to join that. So um, we want to do this uh, in, in EAS because we thought that, as Thomas said, and as um, more people have mentioned, that youth are bringing in the momentum and that people want to hear what they have to say. So, because if, if young people are not taken seriously enough, then all what's been done so far uh, will not be continued uh, forward in the end. So I want to raise uh, that young people are advocates. Uh, they are able to speak on behalf of their communities and to drive resilience and social change. Uh, young people can be innovators, they can come up with the most uh, creative solutions out there to the most alarming challenges of the planet, such as climate change. We have here, uh, so I've seen some examples here, uh, there is Samir, I don't know where he is, uh, yeah, he's there. He, um, with the rising temperatures in the Himalayas um, and to prevent apple trees from rotting, he came up with this innovative, simple idea uh, of uh, apple storage. So, and there are many um, uh, examples uh, from DRC, from Kenya, from uh, India, from many places that are very inspiring. So this is to say that young people are interested in agriculture, and like what uh, some policymakers and politicians claim, that young people are not interested in agriculture and that they find it uh, unattractive. So we are here to say that it's not like that, and we are interested in agriculture, and we are um, willing to uh, support and implement concrete actions um, to make it uh, more sustainable. What I also want to raise is that uh, young people are still lack like finance, access to land, access to capacity building, um, involvement in decision making from the household level to the big political um, level. Uh, and I think that young people are out, also outcompeted by um, bigger firms, uh, which uh, prevent them to fulfill their uh, full potential. Um, although we are young people, we are digital natives, and we are eager to try new techniques. We are connected with youth across the globe, as you can see in this conference and in other events we organize. And we are ready to innovate, and most of all, we are interested in agriculture. But the most important uh, role of youth that, uh, that I think you should all remember is that we can be troublemakers. And, and we can be, uh, how do we say that? Uh, if we are not on your side, you do not want us on the other side. So we are not, <laughs> we are not scared to bring the neglected areas around us to the table and hold the world leaders and politicians accountable for their actions and their promises. So this is the reason why I want to tell you that young people should be treated as an equal partner and as an implementer of change. And we are all implementers of change and we all need 
to be here and bring our voice uh, forward and change the issues we want to change. So this is also the reason why we are here today in this uh, conference. So yeah, thank you very much for uh, listening to me and uh, I hope you will enjoy this conference uh, as much as I did in the previous ones. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the inspiring words, Omar, and looking forward to the workshop uh, of the night, where we uh, yeah, will start drafting our call to action, which we will present at the, at the end of the, the conference. Uh, yeah, then I want to give the floor uh, to the local committee, to, to Maya. She is a yeah, member of the local committee and has uh, organized here together with members of, of um, this, uh, this ICEA. So yeah, the stage is yours, Mike. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to this year's ICEA. And to those here in person, I hope that you had a good arrival with little to no complications and that you have settled in nicely at the hostel. My name is Maya Herschler, and I am a local ES member. And I would well like to welcome you all in the, in the name of ES Bond. We are very grateful to have the opportunity to host this conference and hope that over the next four days, you will gather vital knowledge of the importance and relevance of cropping systems. Welcome to the city of Bonn, also known as the former capital of Germany, or also known as the birthplace for the famous composer Beethoven, a big university city, and now also the location for this year's International Conference for Youth in Agriculture. It is also one of the first in-person events since the pandemic. Bonn is the perfect location for such an international event. The city is an international and cultural melting pot since it's home to many international organizations in which intercultural exchange is highly valued. So let us do the same thing here at ICEA, where we have united over 30 nations in person and even more online and share our experiences with each other. Additionally, Bonn has a big relevance to the topic of climate change mitigation. It is the permanent seat of the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat and also hosts essential international events like COP23 a couple of years ago. Therefore, Bonn has won this image of being a global green hub with many NGOs working towards a more sustainable future. Therefore, the city of Bonn is a fitting stage for our ICF where we will be exchanging experiences and discussing our role as youth and in the, in the efforts for creating new ideas and opportunities for a more sustainable future. We at Yes Bon have worked many months to make this in-person conference possible, from organizing speakers to getting sponsors and for getting this location. And this wasn't without trouble. We faced many hardships and uncertainties concerning the COVID pandemic, and we couldn't predict the course of this one. No one could, and with skyrocketing cases in December and stricter rules and regulations, we couldn't predict whether we would even be able to host an in-person event. And even though at times having an in-person event seemed almost utopic, we decided to remain optimistic and it paid off because now we're here in person. And for that, I would also like to thank all of you attendants for coming here and taking on the risk of traveling all this way to Bonn, despite the obstacles that COVID has put into your way and making this conference a reality because without the attendance, we wouldn't have a conference. Over the next four days, we have a very exciting program planned up, but unfortunately we are still in the midst of a pandemic. So there are certain rules that I will just quickly go over so that we can have a successful conference. First and foremost, it is important that you wear your mask inside at all times during the conference and that you disinfect your hands regularly. We have hand sanitizers placed throughout the hostel. So if you come by, just sanitize your hands so that we can keep the, the spread of the infection to a minimum. Additionally, we have another precaution. Um, we will be testing you regularly just to make sure that nobody is positive and to make sure that if, in the worst case scenario, we have a positive case, we can keep the infection to a minimum, which would obviously be the worst case scenario. And we're hoping that that will not happen. It is truly amazing to have such an international conference and be able to unite people from all over the world. And thanks to that, having a valuable intercultural exchange and being able to take home valuable experience 
and knowledge. And while we hope that you take home important knowledge, we also don't want you to take home COVID. So please, so please take all the steps and measures necessary to make sure that you remain healthy and remain negative. Despite these rules, the next four days will be very interesting and filled with a lot of different programs. We have the opportunity to hear from professors from the University of Bonn about current cutting edge research on the topic of cropping systems, as well as from important players like Bayer, Krone, and organizations like CGIR and the UNFCCC. Next to gaining this valuable theoretical knowledge, we will also be able to gain insight on the practical execution of this research. You will be having excursions to different experimental farms where you can see exactly how this research is being applied. So over the next four days, you will gather vital knowledge and broaden your horizon about the importance of cropping systems and be able to take home said knowledge and incorporate it into your skill set. So please let the city of Bonn and this conference be a stepping stone for the new innovations for inviting dialogue and scientific discussions in order to, in order to challenge the status quo in agriculture and let our voices as youth be heard. Enjoy the next four days and please remain healthy. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Maya, and uh, yeah, all the local community here supporting us and inviting all those uh, those, those amazing speakers and hosting us here. Uh, yeah, then we move on to, to someone from one of those those international organizations here in Bonn, uh, the UNF Triple C. Uh, yeah, Monsomi Manejan is a team leader adaptation committee unit of the UNFCCC. Uh, he has worked for the government of Lesotho in the past uh, and is now also uh, working on the UN and uh, food system summit in the up on that. So the stage is yours, the main manager here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, and thank you for inviting us to be part of this important uh, conference. And um, I think what you said at the beginning is, is an inspiration to me uh, when you start to see that uh, uh, the way youth are being involved in the international process is improving over the time. And I think also from our side, from where we work, we realize the importance of engaging young people in, in everything that we do. So I'm glad that uh, this, this connection and this synergy uh, is happening. Uh, and I'm there also to be part of this conference, actually. I feel honored to be invited, so thank you very much. Um, just to start, uh, what I wanted just uh, to say, uh, you mentioned it right from the beginning that uh, the science is telling us that um, uh, the food systems are the most at risk. Actually, this is true. Uh, when you look at the science in terms of what systems are being impacted the most by climate change, water and food are the primary ones that are being impacted. And these are the most closest to our being as human beings. Um, and this is because the climate change also uh, impacts every aspect of life. Uh, it doesn't matter where, uh, from nature uh, to our societies, to the economy, and everything else is connected. And this is important uh, that we make sure that then, how do we plan to make uh, and look forward to the future? Um, there's also one thing that also excites me, and I'll tell you at the end of my, my talk. Um, the latest uh, uh, report by the FAO, and by the way, thank you very much to my colleague Tuni, uh, who was honored, honored for, for me to see him speak here. Uh, the latest report on, uh, uh, on the state of food security and nutrition in the world also indicates that we are still far from uh, addressing the hunger. Uh, and in fact, it says that we are not on track to reach zero hunger, which is one of the sustainable development goals, the goal one. And if we continue at the same track with the same mindset that we have today, unfortunately, by 2030, we will still be singing the same song. And unfortunately, maybe even worse, uh, who knows? So there are a lot of uh, uh, indications from science. And I think it's very undoubt, undoubtful that we need to do something about it. Um, now, thinking forward, also now in the, in the SDG context, just like I did in the case, uh, we actually have just eight harvests remaining, if you think of it, uh, at most nine, uh, to make the change that we want to do. 
So what is it that we can have, we can make now to, to, to make the transition that will help us to make sure that in the eight remaining harvest that we have, when we talk about, about zero hunger in 2030, it's actually zero hunger. And we are not talking of the scary numbers that we are talking about uh, today. Uh, we need to think of a future where nutritious foods actually abound, um, reliable and accessible to everyone, where farmers around the world have actually abandoned the practices that we have of monoculture systems that are degrading to the environment, but rather have switched to more regenerative practices that are working together with nature, with the ecosystems, rather than the way we are currently doing now, uh, where we no longer actually uh, strip our fields, dose them with pesticides, and at the end of the day, uh, resulting in no tillage and, 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 and damage to our ecosystems. And all this is possible uh, because we are here, and I'm glad that uh, uh, the youth, but the young people are joining uh, this call in terms of helping the transition that we want to make. At the UN, I'll just tell you a few things that we are doing, and also in the broader context of the UN, perhaps. These are something that some of you may know of that are already happening. Uh, we have launched, or we are supporting a process, we call it the Resilience Frontiers Initiative, where we are actually trying to think ahead, look into the future. Imagine we have achieved the SDGs. So what does our resilient food systems in the future look like? Uh, and what is it that now we need to start to do to make sure that we achieve that change? Uh, this is a, a collective intelligence process. We use the foresight methodology in terms of thinking into the future and harnessing the power of the technology. That, uh, we have a big advantage these days because we have a lot of technology and it's evolving every day that we can leverage and make use of and, and, and think of what we can do in the future that would work better for us than what we are doing now. Um, uh, last year, the UN Secretary General convened the UN Food System Summit. Uh, it was not a once-off event, and then last year actually it was launching this momentum, this new energy into how we deal with our food systems in the UN system. And there's a lot of things that have been established as a follow-up to the UN Food System Summit. One of them is the Climate Resilient Food Systems Alliance, which the UN Secretary we are leading that to try to see what ways can we come together globally from governments, from UN organizations people from all different kinds, indigenous peoples, young people, everyone, how can we all come together to build that climate resilient food systems into the future? Uh, when we are launching work, we are continuing to do that uh, into the future to see what we can do. Uh, again, again, in the Secretariat as well, or in the UNFCCC context, uh, we are starting to look at three possibly very nice ways of maybe we can think of how we can transition into this climate resilient future and into, into the future. And I think the young people, or at least the youth, that's where you come in with your ideas to come up to give us fresh thinking. Because truly it is very important clear now that we cannot deal with the different components of the food systems in isolation. We have to follow that integrated approach in where we think about how do we grow, how do we transport, how do we consume, and how do we dispose of our food. The whole system is connected. And food in itself is also connected with everything else. So the system dynamic modeling that you have, the young minds, the creativeness that people have, we need all that to make sense of this in a good way that can help us transition into the future. Regenerative food production is undoubtedly one of the best ways on how we can feed the soil, not the plants, so that then the soil can feed everything on top of it. Um, the supply chains we have all seen uh, with the climate hazards, every climate hazard that happens always disrupts the supply chains. And nowadays, there are even new factors that are even bigger, COVID, for instance. Uh, and of course, uh, wars and other things, they impact the supply chains are heavy. How can we make sure that we, we, we support those? So we have also uh, another system or, or these discussions that happen at the UNFCCC on agriculture. Some of you that follow the UNFCCC conference, and I'm glad, Thomas, you said you attended the conferences. You know that there's a Coronavia joint work on agriculture, which brings government to decide to discuss together on how to build the resilience of the agriculture systems, but also to lower the emissions in the agriculture sector. And there will be discussions going on and continuing at the conference of the parties that we are looking forward to in November to see how we can continue that debate uh, into the future. We also have a work under what we call the narrow work program on, climate, on, 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 on adaptation to the impact of climate change, where, uh, which is the knowledge of action hub. Uh, which one of the thematic areas that they are looking at this year is actually agriculture and food security uh, in terms of how we can build the resilience. So there's a lot of work I'm trying to say 
that is happening around to ensure that food systems um, are secured into the future and we can use our food systems actually to solve the climate problem and make them also better resilient to the climate problem. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, in our process, which is something that is very important, the Conference of the Paris that is coming up this year has recognized what food among the topics that they want to focus on. And I'm glad that if, I'm sure that you will be there, definitely for sure. And it will be very exciting to see how you can be part of the momentum throughout the year and what we can achieve by the end of the year to make sure that we can transform our seafood systems uh, into the future, into the way that we want. Uh, and now this brings me to, to the, 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 the other thing that I was saying, it's an exciting moment for me to be here because um, when we do our resilient frontiers initiative, I told it's a foresight approach. Uh, one of the philosophies that we have is that um, uh, we cannot solve uh, the problems with the same minds that created them. And that's why we need the young people, the young minds, the freshness in the thinking to help us these problems because we created the problems, but we need to, to find a different mindset to solve this problem because we cannot solve them with the same mind that we created them. And youth and health in this setting is a very important piece to do. We see you actually as very strong partners here. Uh, and in the work that I do on adaptation as well, um, one thing that we have started to do, because normally when we see youth or young people on certain topics, we always think of advocacy, but we forget that youth are actually the drivers of change as well. There are a lot of young agripreneurs these days that are actually, like you were rightfully saying, the former president was rightfully saying that it's not that young people hate agriculture, they are already there in agriculture. So we need to amplify that and make sure that we center the, the young people as part of the solution. So thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for these wonderful words. And yeah, for sure, there will be two people uh, in this room also going to COP as part of our uh, competition. So I'm sure uh, we will bring bring those. those. They are also already uh, young entrepreneurs in, in the agricultural system. So yeah, we are looking forward to showing uh, those, those, those projects also there and highlight them at the event also from the UNFCCC. Uh, we are also uh, yeah attending a few events there, so we're happy to share uh, share that there. All right, and then uh, we go to the last speaker uh, of this day uh, from the University uh, of Bonn, uh, Professor Elke Lukeling. He um, is a decision analyst in horticulture, and uh, will give also um, uh, yeah his presentation afterwards. So, stage is yours. Great to. Uh, are here and uh, that University of Bonn is also so involved in, in this conference. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I might have to load up the yeah. presentation first. Yeah. Uh, I'll be with that. So, are you here? Yeah. Yeah, we also have one here. That's oh, okay. So okay. it's not. Uh... Yeah. Is it this one? Uh, yes. Yes, then I will probably close it and then we can. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm also on behalf of the University of Bonn now. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Bonn in horticultural sciences here, but I've done a lot of work in international spaces that I think 
hopefully qualify me to, uh, to give an address to this uh, illustrious audience that we have here today. It's super exciting to have so many young, fresh minds uh, here in Bonn. I mean, it's already been said before, I can only, well, basically uh, join my, my the, the previous speakers here in, in welcoming you, um, welcome you to this uh, to the city of Bonn here. So these are, these are ex exciting times in a way and somewhat troubling times that we're living in that you, you are spending your, your young years in. Um, we have obviously a lot of kind of global crises that we're dealing with. We've already heard about climate change. We know about food security. I know many of us are from countries where food security is still, food security is still a major issue. We've heard about the, the millions and millions of hungry people that are still um, out there hoping to get fed better in, in, in the future. And we are kind of the ones to make it happen to some extent, not alone, but we are supposed to make the contribution and we all want to, this is what brings us here. Um, we also are living in times where some of the things that we sort of took for granted, I mean, as speaking as a German, as a European, I can say some of the things that I've been taking for granted for the past 40 plus a bit years of my life, not quite, but like 30 something years of my life, have all of a sudden sort of fallen apart, kind of global health or just everyday natural kind of whatever, interacting with people have has disappeared for some time. We're all sitting here with masks. I'm happy to try. I get to take it off at least for a few minutes here. But this has been, of course, something we've taken for granted for a long time. Even worse, the last few days, we are all of a sudden we're having a, a war here in Europe. And I, I realize some of you come from countries where wars are not as far away as they have been for me for, for, me for a long time. <clears throat> uh, I still remember vaguely from my childhood days the kind of the, the Cold War situation, but that ended when I was like 13 or something. So not a lot of memories of that. And all of a sudden we're back into this, in this Im immense uh, situation of tension, which kind of, I think, shakes up some of the uncertainty, some of the certainties we've all sort of held all, our, all throughout our years. And I don't want to make this a big story, but maybe uh, if it's okay for you, could we take a few seconds of silence to commemorate the, uh, the suffering that's currently happening over in Ukraine and, uh, well, pray or at least think, send our thoughts to those, those who are currently in such difficult situation. All right, so but let's 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 turn a bit more hopeful because uh, some something that is also happening <clears throat> at the moment that gives actually gives me hope to some extent. We've we've also we've also seen, and you're probably all already experiencing a bit of the frustration that comes with seeing all kinds of things going wrong in agriculture and food systems, and nothing actually ever changing, and not at least not fast enough, not as fast as we'd like to see it. So I've worked quite a bit of climate change and we've just heard again, we're not making enough progress. These things aren't going fast enough. And it's, it's kind of easy to get, get uh, desperate a little bit and, and frustrated, um, especially when you see on the side of inaction, there are vested interests who are basically, who seem to be trying to, and who are trying to slow progress down. We're spreading misinformation and, and false solutions and all kinds of smoke screens to keep us from acting. We sometimes know the, the communication channels that people know at work that these people use and the, the communication tactics they're using. And it's frustrating to see that there's so little we can do against them and it's the social media empires that are behind us, et cetera. But it's also what, what, I'm, what, what these days remind me of, especially, especially maybe like the turn, in, the, the turn of events in Eastern Europe is that, th is that things actually aren't static. Things can change, history can change. Sometimes there's big momentum that arises from certain actions. And of course, sometimes we have kind of the, the say the forces of evil. I don't want to point any fingers, but I, um, there is a person I will point a finger at, at in this case. We've also seen other, other unfortunate actors on the political stage in recent years and in various countries. And it's, it's easy to look at those people and say, oh, it's all, it's all getting worse and worse. Um, but then there's also, there are also others. And I want, to, I want us to, Particularly to take a look at the agents of change on the on the on the positive side, on the side of good. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking of the likes of Greta Thunberg, younger than all of you, who are shaking up the generation, who are turning into leaders of, of global change in a in a positive direction. And I also want to want to point out that, I mean, again, for very unfortunate reasons, but what is what has been happening in Ukraine 
I seriously started a discussion that might actually end up with something really positive, which is finally a change away from fossil fuels towards more renewable energies. So all of a sudden, the funds are there. The momentum is there for some change. Yeah, so this is happening in the energy sector currently. This can also happen in agriculture. I think we haven't looked enough at the disinformation communication strategies that are being employed in agriculture by the big vested interests that are out there. Maybe we took this and took, uh, we should take a, a closer look at what's happening there. But we should also work for this, look for these moments of change and these opportunities to actually make, make a big difference. And I think these moments do come from time to time. Sometimes you have to wait for the, set, the, the settings to be right for some change to really happen. But I think it is important for us to, to realize that individuals can make a difference. I mean, whatever Greta Thunberg started, it meant she started not going to school and made a story out of it. Yeah, sometimes little things, I mean, obviously there's a lot more to this, but this is how it started. Yeah? So this, this is somebody who have seen an opportunity to make a difference and made a change. A young person with a great idea, great ideals who actually made a difference. And I think, I think you're all here because this is actually maybe who you want to be or who you could be. Uh, we've already seen some great young talent here on the stage with a difficult acts to follow, I must say. And I'm, I'm confident that, that we have the talent in this room, and not only in this room, also online, and, and these, the many other people who didn't make it to this meeting, but who are also interested in these issues, we have the potential to make a difference. Um, yeah, so maybe I'm already turning too old for this, and, and I mean, as, as uh, our friend here said, we, we do need the young minds, which is probably you, and not necessarily, uh, maybe it's still me, I shaved, so you can't see the gray hair this morning. <laughs> um, but there is, there is an opportunity to, to make a difference. And I think the, the power of movements is something that is very, very strong, obviously, obviously in this room today and, and in your generation in general. Also, the power of individuals. Yeah? You can all, as we already heard, you can all become leaders of the, 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 the fight, maybe, or, or the, the, um, the journey towards sustainable food systems and, and climate resilience and all of those great ideas. And, and I know this, this motivates all of you. And, and uh, this is fantastic to see, see all of you here. There are certainly jobs for us to do, um, and there's responsibilities we have, and maybe certain things we should plug on. I mean, we should be the ones, as agricultural scientists, and I want to point that out, we're actually special. That we're the ones who don't really know anything in detail. Yeah? I'm going to say that again later on. But we know many things, and we, we have the ability to put the pieces together. Yeah, so, so never underestimate who we are. We're the agricultural science community. We're not the ones, possibly not the ones who are going to send the latest or the, the most detailed mechanisms of whatever plant cells. But we can be the ones who see the big picture and who see the connections. We know the food systems. We know the international material and communication flows, all of these things. And we have the critical, well, the broad knowledge and the critical skills, hopefully, to make sense of the system and find solutions no. that work. And we have to, of course, be critical and apply the systemic perspective to whatever context we're in. And um, quest ask questions and, and be critical about informations and narratives that are out there. Um, there's so much kind of misinformation, there's also erroneous information possibly, and, and there's, there, are, there is a role for us to help clear these things up. Because there's a lot of people out there, and you'll, you'll realize, you'll meet many people in your career, you already have, who seem absolutely brilliant, but if you think about it, or if you look a little closer, they know their field, but they don't really know the connections. And so this, this is our role, and this is so important for making this world more sustainable and working towards the ideal ideals that we all uh, share. So what the, um, the mission of this conference is that we want to learn about cropping systems of the future. In the, in the program, I don't really know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if this is going to happen <clears throat> because we don't really know what the cropping systems of the future will be. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, it's great to look at things that might become the future, might turn into the future, and we should get these inspirations. But keep in mind that the future, the cropping systems of the future, future have not been developed yet. Yeah, so there's a normative uh, challenge here. We we are the ones who have to design these systems, and we have to think about what these what these systems should look like. What should they be? And they may not, not necessarily be the systems that whatever the guy from the agricultural engineering company will, will talk about, or the guy from the genetic engineering lab. They may be different things. And it's, it's really, really up to us to design the system. And I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a lot of, um, I'm, I'm very confident actually that, that we'll find something good. If I, if I look at this room and I look at all these, these motivated faces here, and obviously brilliant minds behind these faces. 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure we can find something, but keep in mind that we're shaping the system. We're coming in to learn from the from the wise people who, who we may, may be running into, but we're also here maybe to get some inspiration, but don't don't let them tell you what the solution is, because that was that's something that we all have to develop together. And you're the ones who have to live with this stuff for much longer than the experts you might be might be learning from today. Yeah, so how do we get there? This is this is really, really up to us and, and, and shaping shaping the future is, is our challenge and not necessarily only the ones of the old people who think they already found the solutions. So I think this is a super exciting quest, and I'm, I'm really happy that all of you have, cho have chosen to join this quest and this mission, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to all of your contributions over, over the next few, next many decades, actually. It's not only a few, it's actually quite a, quite a few, and that makes me really positive. Um, many of the things I wanted to say in addition have already been said before, so um, I wanted to welcome you to Bonn as well. Somebody's already, Maya has already done that very successfully. Uh, is this former capital of Germany? It has lots of things, still ministries here will shape the, that shape the future of German agriculture. Um, it's also the second largest United Nations city. We've had a brilliant representative of one of the secretariats here already. There are 16 other secretariats here. This is a super powerful actor on the international stage here, this, this very city within. And we have lots of research institutes, I can't even name all of them, that work in the agricultural space. So there's a lot going on here. And lots of organizations working on sustainability and certification. Yeah, we have the Forest Stewardship, Stewardship Council and uh, IFOAM, uh, IFOAM yeah, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movement's headquarters is here, and lots of other actors. So it's really a fascinating city to be in. And of course, then there's the University of Bonn, which is a brilliant institution that I have the honor of working for. Um, one of the leading universities in Germany, a university of excellence, which universities tend to be really proud of for some reason if they get awarded that title. Um, we have a pretty complete, complete spectrum of scientific, scientific disciplines. The med medical, uh, medicine people are somewhat in this region here, but we have all, have all kinds of things, anything you can imagine here. About 4,500 staff, more than 550 professors, so there's a lot going on here, and also lots of your, your, fellow, your colleagues and fellows here. 35,000 students, 7,000 PhD students, lots of young minds also here who are working towards hopefully good cause in, in all cases. Outstanding faculty of agriculture, of course, with several really attractive study programs at MSc and BSc level, also PhD studies, of course. I just want to highlight one briefly that I have the privilege of leading as of uh, last uh, early this year or last year, which is the master's program in agricultural uh, sciences and resource management in the topics and subtopics that may be of interest to some of you. Uh, it's really cool. It's an interdisciplinary two-year pro uh, program at a master's level where students develop a holistic cross-disciplinary understanding of agricultural systems and basically are equipped with lots of tools to help them become effective leaders in agricultural development, which many of you are aspiring to be, maybe all of you, and prepare people for careers in this space. Uh, so lots of um, cool potential here, and it's also really fun. And you can do a PhD afterwards if, uh, if you're good enough and, and somebody takes you on. Um, finally, to the Germans in the room, I, I promise to, to shout out these, to give a shout out to these guys, uh, us really, I'm part of this uh, at any occasion I get. Uh, the Council for Tropical and Subtropical Agricultural Research in Germany, it's called ATSAF. It's a long name in German that means something about the same. Um, and uh, this is basically the, the main organization in Germany that, combat, that, that uh, bundles all this international, the national agriculture related research in Germany and provides lots of connections to, um, uh, to well, it, it promotes multidisciplinary research. So you have to turn around all the time here because it's going to see it otherwise. Um, it connects members with cooperation partners and lots of links to the CGIR system that you hear about tomorrow, I think, for example. Um, and we offer scholarships and travel grants and basically provide some of these resources that uh, you were talking about earlier that young people are lacking. Uh, you, the Germans, at least in this room, can find it here. So um, we also uh, organize an annual conference, the Tropenthal Conference. And it's basically a great launching pad for international career in agricultural development. So consider joining us. And um, that's what I wanted to say. I, I basically just wanted to well, I hope that it well wish you wish you that you enjoy the ECR 2022 conference. And in particular, so I looked at this at this brochure very carefully. In particular, make around that you make sure that you stay around for agenda item number two. Thank you.
you very much, and let's look for revolution indeed. <laughs> yeah, this was the, the opening ceremony uh, of ICEA, so we uh, yeah, officially open the conference now. So basically, we will now uh, move on to a uh, presentation for an hour, and everybody will uh, have a short break. Um, so yeah, I would uh, yeah, like to thank uh, all the speakers of today. Uh, and, uh, yeah, let, let's get ICEA started. We will have yeah, a short break, so I'll make sure everything is running online too. So you can stand up, stretch your legs for a bit, and then uh, yeah, we will start in a few minutes. Right. Thank you so much. Share this one. It's the same one. It's just the next slide. I see. Yeah, I have to see. I think I forgot sharing the screen. Let's see if it's also sharing on Zoom. Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most are running on music. Yeah. I will ask them, yeah. I will ask them. Yeah. Why? Please, can we have the booklets?
enggak sih apa maksudnya biasa aja sih dia mah cuman cuman Please. I don't want to meet that me now. I think it will work. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, we can. All right, perfect. But it's fine. Yes, I can hear you.
think it's just through maybe when you go back to the time. Yeah, is it not working again? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> All right. Uh, welcome back from the coffee break. And uh, surprise, it's me again. Sorry about that. I didn't make the program. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to talk about how to become a cropping system scientist because I didn't really know what trends to tell you about in cropping systems. So um, who I am, man, uh, quick, quick, quick words to who's, who's talking to you and why I feel somewhat qualified to, to talk about this. I've kind of had a bit of an experience already in agriculture. I've uh, studied organic agriculture being at the beginning of my career, I really knew what the solutions were, so I went for organic agriculture. Uh, that was a long time ago at the University of Kassel, and then I got into tropical agriculture. This is a mountain oasis in Oman. You see here a bit of an odd location to work in, but I spent a lot of time there looking at the sustainability of these oasis systems. And, and at some point, I discovered fruit trees were growing there, so I started looking at the fruit trees and why are they growing there, and then how can that work here in the tropics? Uh, why, is, why are these temperate trees here? And that got me to climate change. Uh, since about 2007, I've been working on climate change issues because there were some interesting issues there. And for some for a long time, I looked at how temperate trees will respond to climate change and what the challenges are. And that the challenges are huge. And I took this to UC Davis, University of California, for a few years. I uh, kept working there. And then got into agroforestry, which I've been excited about before. But I, I focused on this full time for a number of years, for about eight years. At, at World Agroforestry in Kenya first, and then I was based here in Bonn for some time. And as of uh, 2013, we got into a different field that I'll talk a bit about later on, decision analysis, and it seems like it's something totally different and unrelated to what we're talking about, but it isn't, and I hope to convince you that it isn't during this talk. And then, well, looking for a permanent position, and then moved to the university, and since 2018, I've been a professor of horticulture here. I'm also looking at the horticultural systems. Now, um, <clears throat> what I encountered is throughout this career was kind of an increasingly complex uh, agricultural world, essentially. And so uh, as much as this, uh, this landscape here that looks like the flag of, of, the, of Ukraine somehow, um, this is a productive agricultural landscape, of course, but it's not really particularly complex. And really, when you look into the real world and if you look at the systems that we may, we probably, I imagine most of us think are possibly the solutions to our problems, it's not so simple. Uh, we, uh, so this, this was my experience from, from Oman. It's too, totally complicated, very, very small scale, lots of different things grown, grown here. Um, this is an agroforestry system from Kenya. Some of you work on this, I've already learned during the, during the coffee break, but always here we have field crops and we have trees and maybe some animals running around and sometimes there's even a farmer and stuff like that. Um, horticulture is even worse, I've discovered there's so much that really could, should, I should be talking about in my classes and I, of course 99 and more percent of this I don't have no idea about. <laughs> and lots of things to know about this as well. And overall, if you look at the at agricultural landscapes and agricultural systems, there's a lot going on, yeah? especially when, it, when you look at smallholder, set, smallholder settings. There are so many biophysical, social, economic processes that we need to understand about. And it's really quite, quite challenging. Yeah? So agricultural systems are always complex. And, and this is sort of something that we have to learn to deal with as agricultural scientists. And it's actually something that I think we're not particularly well prepared for through our training often. I don't know if anyone feels, from, feels well prepared to take on a complex agricultural system, if you consider all of those things that are going on. I certainly didn't throughout most of my, of my studies, including after my PhD, I learned certain, uh, certain scientific methods that weren't really particularly helpful to some extent, yeah? because we have lots of elements here that are going, that are, that are um, involved. We have lots of processes, lots of interactions between them. And somehow all of these are important. We also have lots of constraints that limit what people can do in these landscapes. And if we don't understand them, we won't be able to develop appropriate solutions. There's a biophysical constraints. What can you do in a particular situation, in a particular climate? Economic constraints, yeah, what can you make money off if that doesn't work, then the farm is not going to be particularly functional. And then there's sometimes there are social constraints yeah, in terms of labor conditions and then various other things that we need to keep in mind. And then something that I've discovered <clears throat> um, 
and throughout my, through my work on agroforestry mainly, but also here in Germany, is very, very strong, the legal constraints and the institutional barriers that, that really prevent change from happening. These we have somehow to understand if we want to develop solutions that fit with, within that space. We have to understand it even more. Everyone mute your microphones, please. Thank you. Um, we have to understand them if we want to develop systems that fit within the legal settings, but we have to understand them even better if we want to change these legal settings to, to accommodate the solutions for the future. Um, so we also have complex expectations of agriculture. This system here produces food and I don't know what else. That's not enough. We want, we want them to do more for us. We want them to do to certainly be sustainable. That's I, think, I mean, I don't know if there are any systems where we can say that for sure so far, but we want them to, to, to work within the environmental and the economic and the social space, of course. Yeah, all, of these, all of these dimensions of sustainability should ideally be met. Uh, we can have, make this a lot more complicated if we look at the sustainable development goals, which give us a very, very comprehensive framework for thinking about when, uh, what sustainability means, which is great. Yeah? It's just fantastic that we have all these dimensions on the table, but of course it makes the, the, the job of evaluating whether a system is sustainable a lot harder, yeah? because there are a lot of things that we have to think about all of a sudden that were not really so important before. If it was, if it was just about the, the potato yields or something, and that's all we care about, then it's easy if we also have to think about erosion control and recreational benefits or whatever, then it becomes a lot more difficult. And we can take the framework, of course, of ecosystem services. I'm sure you're all familiar with this concept. We want systems to provide for us food and fiber and all those things, but we also want to want them to um, basically regulate things like the water household and the climate. We want them to support biodiversity, provide habitat for wild species of plants and animals. And we want them to also, in many countries more than others, we want them to provide cultural services. We want these to be our homes, the systems we identify with, the systems where we go to relax and, and recharge. So all of these things are important. And then somehow we have to decide which systems are sustainable in all of these dimensions and which ones aren't. And how can farms really become sustainable if it's such a challenge, if they're so complicated, and, and um, if there's so many dimensions we have to consider. And this somehow is, this is our job. When we talk about the mission that we, we're all on here, this is what we're working. I think we're all working towards this, but how do we do this in such a complicated environment? There's no shortage of, of proposals for what is sustainable. Yeah, and, and there are very good reasons for all of them. Yeah, just agroecology, for example, which is fantastic. Yeah, let's use all of these ecosystem services that are naturally uh, provide it and, and like work with nature to make things make things happen. There are also reasons why it may not work in, in many situations. It takes a lot of knowledge, a lot of things can go wrong. Yeah? So there, there are barriers and, and reasons why this is actually much harder than it seems initially. You can put a label on it and call it organic. So this is where I started my career with the conviction that this is the solution. But then actually it's not so easy if you look at the details in many settings. Things like reduced tillage are great solutions that some people are super excited about, come with trade-offs. Yeah? Usually it requires more herbicides and other things to control weeds. Yeah? So it, it solves some problems maybe, but it creates others. Sustainable intensification is one of those buzzwords of uh, the last decade or so that people have, have been talking about. Great idea, what does it really mean? Hard to say yeah? in, in detail. Usually people will try to sell you all kinds of uh, practices under that label. And if you look closely, then they're usually the practices they've always been trying to sell you. They just put a new label on them. Same with climate smart agriculture. We just talked about that before. Um, regenerative agriculture, possibly a bit the same. Yeah? It's a little bit like the SDGs. It, it provides a great framework to think about stuff. Yeah? We, like sustainability is sort of yesterday's uh, ambition, we actually want to make the world better. We want to make our agricultural systems better. So that's, of course, we're scaling up our ambitions to really have the solutions to make it work in an economically and socially uh, sustainable way. I don't know. There are certainly great ideas out there and many things, um, I mean, it's a fantastic movement and I think it's super inspiring to interact with this, with this space. A lot of room still to find the solutions though. I don't believe everyone who's put the label on, on their system that their stuff is actually too regenerative. Agroforestry is a system that I'm, uh, or a practice I'm super excited about, integrate 
perennials, woody perennials into, um, into systems, shrubs or trees with crops or livestock. This is a system from Europe here, from France. We have mature poplars in the wheat field. Have we ever thought that agriculture could look like this? Maybe not. Uh, some, somebody had that idea and it seems to be working okay. Probably also some clay helps involved. If you're a farmer, you may be worried about, okay, my, my, well, what about if my harvester is twice as wide or uh, what about the shading of the, <clears throat> of the wheat by the trees if you're a forester? You'd be wondering about all oh, this damn crops here in the way. There's, there's a good chance that if we broaden our perspective and we, we comprehensively look at all the components, we may actually find that this is a very, very profitable and, and, and good, but somewhat sustainable system here. Great situation, great, great example also from, from Tanzania here. This is also an agroforestry system. Uh, maybe some people have seen this picture before, it's, it's been floated around a lot. Um, what you see here is a um, no. These, these big trees here is a species called Phytherbia albina, which strangely uses its leaves in the, in the rainy season. And so it doesn't shade the maize that's grown under it and actually it provides, which since it's a legume, it provides fertilizer to the, to the maize plants and they actually grow better than they would if the trees weren't there. So such solutions are there. Can we find such a system here for Bonn? I don't know. Can, they, can we find it for you places? I don't know. We have to look for them. We have to see see if there are such natural solutions that can be applied. Um, the future can look different. Uh, agro photovoltaics. This is something that some people, some of my colleagues here, here are working on with solar panels and, and see what crops we can grow underneath. Possibly also a good, good solution. And we can go more technical, even genetic engineering. Yeah, there's a lot of um, people using the CRISPR-Cas and various technologies telling us that this is going to solve all of our problems. Personally, not so sure it's going to really work out on, on many of the environmental issues that we're facing. But of course, there is also a space for these kind of solutions. But and once again, don't believe everybody who, who tells you that this is the future and this is sustainable, sustainable. They often come with a pretty narrow perspective and they may not have that agricultural science view that we have to contribute. Or we can get even more technical. Some people here in Bonn are, are working on such solutions robotics, automation, the internet of things and all kinds of things. Um, this morning I had a video call with the um, with a, a, an initiative here on digitalization in agriculture and the, the well the ideas that people have are robots that harvest that collect eggs and stuff like that. There's also a lot of a lot of potential here, but of course it's up to us at some point to say whether this is actually what we want to see or whether we want a different type of agriculture. It doesn't involve one of them. Um, so all of these all of, all of these really feasible? I don't know. Are all of these sustainable? I have my doubts. Are all of these desirable? And this is the normative question. This is what we probably have to help decide at some point. Is this actually what we want? And I think the only people who can make that call and develop and the best people to develop an opinion here are us, the agricultural community. What implications will they have? Hard to say. How can we can how can we find out? Well, I suppose this is agricultural science's role. Uh, we're, to some extent, we're not the ones to necessarily just follow the trends and develop whatever the spare parts for the robots. Yeah? We may be the ones who actually help decide whether this is the direction we want to go and, and what the implications are on the system scale. Now, here's how our agricultural science usually works, however. Um, we have a, a complex agricultural system here. I've shown you this before. And then we take one little element, like say the sheep here, and we put it in a make an experiment with a sheep, yeah? put it into a test tube and have many sheep, of course, so we can do statistics and all these cool things. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, this is our experiment. We've taken it out of the system. We've reduced the complexity to just look at one little element. Great, we can find out a lot of things about the sheep. We could probably spend our careers on just this one sheep. And yeah? there's so many body parts it has, and the microbes and the guts and all kinds of things. Um, but really, this, this requires us, and many of our of the, of the techniques, the scientific strategies we learn about, require us to basically focus just on isolated aspects of the system. And we're often, we're often forced to lose the systemic perspective that is so important to understand how everything is related. And if we specialize, yeah, we can find, lots of, lots, find out lots of things about um, this, this, these particular aspects, but there's a risk of focusing too narrowly. And this is where we're getting into a little bit the system scientist uh, uh, aspects that I wanted to talk about. There's risks of a narrow focus. 
Yeah, and um, the main one is that we lose sight of the big picture. Um, we overlook key aspects of sustainability. You often find, often find that with people who work on like little technical issues, they have like their, their little solution and they haven't really thought beyond their test tube and they're still promoting this as the big solution for this for the planet. Um, we, can, we may develop things that fail. Great ideas up to a certain point. When it comes to the agronomic aspects, can a farmer actually implement this? They often things aren't often aren't feasible. Sometimes there are legal constraints. Actually, also in the area of agroforestry, this is common. Now, often if you put a tree on your field, you get all kinds of trouble. Yeah, this um, is important to know. The markets and the economics, of course, don't work work for many of the great agroecological solutions, unfortunately. Um, and their path dependencies. That basically means that, that somebody, an actor, a farmer, for example, is in a particular situation because of how they got there. And now they have their, their, their barn full of certain type of animals and they have their shed full of a certain, a certain type of machines and they can't easily switch to something else and they won't be able to do this anytime soon. It's important to recognize these things too. And we may have may fail to anticipate negative side effects of systems and, and also so-called rebound effects. Now, if you think, for example, about food security and hunger, many people are still out there saying, oh, we have, don't have enough food, it needs to get cheaper, we need cheaper food for everyone. Well, we have lots of cheap food, we have lots of cheap grain, not way enough to feed the whole population. What have we done? We're using that cheap food to, to, to produce animals. 80% of the agricultural land of this planet is used to produce animals. It wouldn't need so many. If we had fewer animals, we could feed everyone. But it's precisely because we have such abundant grain that this actually happened. And these are implications. Maybe it's a difficult for, to foresee when you're in the particular situations. But I think we have to develop the perspective to think ahead and think about what happens when we do certain things. Um, now we often only detect these things in hindsight. And I wonder if we can develop a mindset that allows us to forecast and develop foresight a bit better. Can we broaden our perspective earlier? And I think that is possible. And the classic approach, of course, is multidisciplinary collaborations. I specifically call it multi, you know, inter at this point, because this, this has often been the approach that we sort of do many studies on many little different aspects, and we stack them on top of each other, and we try to understand the system. Yeah? So something like this, somebody's working on the sheep, and this is us again. We also find a colleague who's worked on the cow, and then there's another person who worked on the, the tractor and like some tillage aspects. Great. Doesn't often work because these things are often not compatible. Uh, people do different things and they can't actually be combined easily. Uh, but also, and, and more problematically, we usually can't get enough of the pieces together. Uh, we have to do an infinite number of studies and it would be infinitely expensive to really understand the system. If we take this very detailed approach, figure out everything there is to figure out about the sheep, and then go from there, I think we'll never really reach a point where we can predict system behavior, which is ultimately what we need to do. Now, so su sufficient knowledge will be up here and this, this little pyramid is not really quite there yet. So becoming systems oriented scientists, what does it mean? I think we should be able to look beyond the, our area of specialization. Now, I'm not gonna tell you for career reasons, don't specialize at all. Yeah, maybe you have to, maybe you have to. I'm not saying you do have to, but maybe you have to. I'm still unsure about whether that's a good recommendation not to specialize, but don't do it too much. Try to be interdisciplinary. You know? don't, don't hope to meet people if you're to be an economist and meet social scientists and natural scientists and then work with them. You have to be interdisciplinary. And you have to have a perspective that allows you to, be, to have interfaces, yeah? to, um, to work with others, right? work with different people and also develop since you have the perspective, you have probably learned about many of the things that I talked about already. You know them and you should keep them in mind whenever you work. You have to be able to look at systems from different angles. You have to understand farms to some extent. But don't only be a scientist, be a little bit of farmer at least. Um, understand ecology, understand the economics, understand the social dimensions of agriculture and understand the rules and regulations. So that's the part that's certainly least fun, but if you <laughs> don't understand this at all, then you will probably develop something that doesn't work in practice. Yeah, and we have to be able to keep an eye on all the functions that agriculture must fulfill. There are lots of frameworks, how to keep an eye on all of them, but be aware that they exist and be aware of the different dimensions. 
And this, of course, requires superheroes. Huh? So, is, does do these such people exist? People who qualify who, according to all of these criteria? Do they? Well, I see a few. Um, and these are agricultural scientists. Yeah? This is this is what we have to be, in my view. Yeah. Or agricultural system scientists, I should say. Not everyone needs to be a system scientist, but this is what is also needed. Yeah, so we learn about all of this stuff, or we can learn about all of this stuff if we don't specialize too much. Uh, we can get in the big picture, and uh, even though we may not be the ultimate expert in any discipline, you all face this situation at some point. That even the most, whatever, the first first semester student from molecular biology will still more, know more about certain things in agriculture and certain of the biology of our crops that you will never know. But uh, we can learn to put the pieces together. Now, this is our role. And this is why I put this thing that's supposed to be a mirror, but it doesn't work that great in a projection. Yeah, but so you can, you should all be able to look into this and hopefully see yourself. Yourself now or yourself in the future or whatever, whatever I want. This is who we can be. So uh, my advice is really to keep foraging widely. Now, don't specialize too much. Um, I've recently, um, um, very cool book about it. I'm going to show this in a minute. Learn many things, so not only about agriculture. Yeah? Look, look at different different things and get many perspectives. There's this range, uh, this this uh, book that I recently read, Range, which is basically about just that. That the most the most valuable assets in many fields are the ones who haven't only specialized on that very field. Because if you do, then it basically means you bring no new ideas into the space. And if you have bring different perspectives to the table, then you might be a lot more valuable. In, in whatever you do. And we see this in agriculture all the time. People coming in from different directions with new ideas. Um, yeah, um, and uh, as you as you learn about all these things, don't lose, try not to lose confidence uh, because it is easy to, to realize that you don't know much. Yeah? But this is a, a stage of learning. It's not the end, it shouldn't give you, lead you to give up. And it's important to know about this thing here. Maybe you know already, some of you have probably heard about this. For those of you who have, I'm going to re remind you, and for those of you who haven't, I'm going to tell you now, so-called Dunning-Kruger effect, very, very important phenomenon to know. Basically, it's a relationship between your knowledge and your skill or your wisdom and your confidence in it. And ideally, of course, <clears throat> we'd have a situation where the more we learn, the more confident we, we would get into in our, in our understanding, but that's not how it goes. It's more like this. Yeah, there are people who've learned just a little bit about something and then they believe they, they've understood everything. I, I've been in this situation, of course, as a teenager, everybody's in this situation. <laughs> but uh, many people also, when they become president of like some large country or something, right? people with almost no idea of something and they're still out there confidently saying, tell, telling you what the solutions are. And you may not be there anymore. You may actually have learned more um, and have moved towards the, towards the right side of this graph. And then there are certain names for these, these points in the landscape. This Mount Stupid first. Very difficult to, to, to interact and to discuss with these people. But then there's the value of despair. And this is, I've seen students in this situation and giving up, giving up the studies. So you learn stuff and you realize how difficult and complicated everything is. Maybe some of you are in that valley right now. <laughs> maybe, maybe some of you have been in this situation. If you are, don't give up. Yeah? This is a stage of learning. This is perfectly normal. Everyone goes into this at some point when you work on something complex. And you should know that there is a slope of enlightenment that takes you ultimately, hopefully, to a, to a, a situation where you can talk with the guy on one stupid again and actually win the discussion, win the battle. Maybe not. They are they're incredibly powerful, these people, but we have to somehow confront them. Um, we always remember who we're working for. Very important to keep the farmers in mind. Yeah? Um, put yourselves in the shoes of farmers and other actors in the agricultural system. Now, don't just work on your, as a scientist. Sometimes emulate the situation of other people. Uh, learn from these people, involve them in your research. Get them involved in planning your experiments. Yeah? Maybe they can give you insights and hints that you really should be keep, keeping in mind that you can't take on board. What concerns do they have? What constraints and actions? Why aren't they doing the stuff that you think is right? What questions need, do they need to get answered for? They may not be the ones that we, we ask as scientists. They may have totally different issues and concerns. Huh? Um, try to ground your excitement a little bit. I mean, we all tend to get excited about particular solutions. 
I've been there many times. I still am in certain in certain ways. But uh, try to keep our let's try to keep our feet on the ground. Yeah, and if you have found the solution, uh, always ask yourself what could go wrong. Yeah, there's usually some things that could go wrong. And otherwise, everyone would have already with our solution usually. Uh, apply what's called um, I find quite quite interesting, interesting thought experiment, so-called clients pre-mortem. Yeah? Imagine that you are now in 2050 or so, and you've that solution that you have in mind now completely failed. And think about reasons for why that might have happened. Yeah? Uh, sometimes these lead you to identify particular issues that you should be confronting now and can possibly do something about. Now, what are the weaknesses? What are the things the, um, the, that, that the break the possible breaking points? That may make everything, everything collapse. What do others think will go wrong? What, what do the opponents say? Important to engage with the other side of the, of the coin as well. Don't let yourself totally be pushed over easily, but know what the counter arguments are and see if there's possibly uh, also what the farmers are concerned about. Yeah? And, and think about whether they could possibly be right, whether you could be wrong and they could be right, or if the, if the, the, the truth is somewhere in the middle. We have to be somewhat self-critical, otherwise we'll be selling things to farmers that ultimately will have bad consequences, yeah, negative consequences. Um, very important thing about impact. Impact-oriented thinking is very important in our space. Yeah? Because we all, we've already heard it uh, today, we want to do transformative research to some extent. Uh, I, I've heard it today in the presentation. Sorry. We want to do transformative uh, impact uh, research. Yeah? We want to change the world. So we have to think about the impact of what we do and how we how we reach our goals ultimately. Yeah. So think ahead a little bit. Yeah? Don't don't work on your tiny little issue only. Think about the next steps. Yeah. So these guys are realizing way too late that they should build a boat and not a bridge. Yeah. Uh, we only realize this if we kind of direct our ways not on, our eyes not only at the, the paper here in front of us but also a little bit down the road from time to time. What's the impact pathway of our research? Uh, how will our vision become reality? How can we actually make the change we want to make? Uh, who are the next users of our research? Now, who is the one who needs to learn about the stuff we're doing? And is there maybe somebody who needs to be on board already in your work? Or is there somebody who you should focus with particular communication in order to really make a difference at the end? Yeah? Who needs to be on board? Very important question. Um, and what evidence is needed to make a change? Um, so impact pathways are really uh, something that I've only learned about in my career with the CGIR, with World Agro Forestry. Uh, in, re in research is usually what we learn about in university is the data collection and analysis part, and then maybe this part also. We write papers and reports and presentations and maybe policy briefs if we're particularly in life. But there's more afterwards. Now there's the outcomes, the so-called outcomes, which is behavioral change. Somebody does something different. The change in mindset by some key actors out there that actually make a change. And then ultimately, that's not something we do in personally, usually as scientists, there's the impacts where lives and livelihoods are improved. The actual difference we want to make. Now, this is what we learn, and this is what we really want to achieve. So not so easy, not directly connected, but how can we make these steps more likely? How, how can we raise the chances that the impact really happens? And um, for, for understanding this, there's, there's a few, a few um, key qualities of research that I quickly want to introduce uh, to you. Maybe you have heard about them, maybe not quite yet. Um, the research impact prospects depend on the kind of the, the nature of the information we deliver. And there are three main dimensions of, of research quality that I want to highlight here. First one is the credibility of our research that basically is whether what we've done is technically sound and we follow the, the Normal scientific. <laughs> then there's also the salience, a bit more of a complicated term. It basically um, is the question of whether what we produce is relevant to the actions of a particular decision maker, somebody who's or an agent of change, whatever you want to call them. And the third one that's maybe even more important and more easily neglected is the legitimacy of our knowledge. This basically means whether the actor we, whose behavior we want to change trusts the stuff we develop and this is actually often not the case when people like me go to africa and, and, and get our yeah, newest piece of research and then show this to a politician yeah. of 
course, the response is, who is this guy? Why does he think he, he understands our, our, our work? We haven't been involved. He hasn't talked to us beforehand. And this is stuff that we can do. It's, it's difficult and not something we naturally do, but we can, more, we can early on in the process, we can contact these people, make sure they're on board, maybe help, maybe involve them in designing the work. And that actually greatly, greatly raises the legitimacy of, our, of what we do. Um, so impact pathways and so-called theories of change can, can really help that what we do um, is um, meaningful and they can help us expose the weak links in, uh, in, our, in our work. And here's an example of this. You've probably seen this also. An equation on the board, lots of complicated things on the left and on the right, and in the middle, a miracle occurs. Huh? So this miracle, of course, this is not explicit enough. Huh? It's unlikely that this will happen. But this miracle is this weak link is actually embedded in many research path, impact pathways of research. Um, because usually between these outputs and the outcomes, there's, there's nothing. Yeah? So this miracle here is that the decision maker, the president of whatever country, goes to a scientific database, finds that paper we've written or, that, or, or goes somewhere else and finds a report we put somewhere on the shelf, reads that report, or pays money to read the report, reads the report and changes their behavior. This is a miracle. I don't know if this has ever happened. It's very unlikely to happen. Yeah. Um, so somebody actually have to, has to make a better decision because of our work, and we have to make sure that our stuff fits there. Um, and uh, yeah, this for this to happen, our research needs to be asking, answering relevant questions and be delivered to appropriate channels. Very important to keep in mind. Um, so this brings me to something that we work on, and I said earlier, I'm a decision analyst now, and, and what does that have to do with all of this? So we've we've uh, come across this field. My my former boss, Keith Shepard, at World Forestry, is the one who came up or who, who found this stuff. It's been out there in other fields for a long time. And this thing called decision analysis, which I found really inspiring, and has basically been shaping my work since then. Um, the, this based on the idea that decisions are critical junctures in all the impact pathways. And so we really have to make somebody somewhere make a better decision because of what we do, because we ourselves aren't going to feed all these people. Somebody else has to happen, has to do this. Some government or an NGO or somebody or whatever, somebody with a lot of energy and, and lots of time. Not us ourselves. But decision makers need to consider many things. Right? They, can, they can, don't only care about the bio, biophysical thing we found out. They need to take into account many things. And we've been trying to assume this perspective as a researcher. Um, so, for example, we can assume the farmer's perspective and think about what do they have to consider in their decision making. It's not only whether this crop is working better in a drought, there are many other things connected to that situation that you need to consider. Yeah, we've been using this, this perspective to orient, orient our research and, and um, basically develop this thing we call, um, this, or we call this paper here, decision-focused agricultural research. So this is what we've been trying to, trying to develop. And, one of the ideas here is to include many decision makers and stakeholders in the process. So here's a workshop we had in Nairobi on a uh, pipeline project in, in Northern Kenya, where we first brought all the policymakers and all like the state senator was there, a bunch of people uh, together. They actually had to make a decision ultimately. Um, we have a formal process that I don't want to talk about. When you have a big group, you sort of have to think about how to facilitate this and how to make sure that the, the, the results that come out of it are actually credible and useful. Um, but uh, I want to show you some more examples. Here's some interaction with farmers in Turkana in northern Kenya, um, and, and the group that ultimately made, made the decision model with us on the, on the right side here. Uh, we have uh, worked in Burkina Faso with, with farmers and, and, uh, and technical, technical advisors here. Uh, but we also tried this approach now in Germany here. This is uh, a workshop with Kaluna growers, some ornamental plant producers here, in, 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 not so far from here. Basically, works in any situation, and we try to use this consultation to find out uh, what, what decisions people have to take. Yeah? What are the actual questions they have, and the actual challenges they're facing, um, what their expectations are about the decision options, yeah? so they can choose between different courses of action. What do they expect will happen? Uh, what concerns do they have? What risks they see? And also, what they already know about all of this, yeah? because this is stuff that we, maybe we don't have to work about if they already know. Yeah, and then we try to make a model out of this. We're a modeling group, so we try to try to make a comprehensive holistic model that describes all of this. Um, so some principles here. 
Uh, basically, we try to incorporate all of the important aspects into our model. Yeah? So we're not going to focus too much on this, just this sheet and the test tube. We'll try to keep everything in the model. Uh, which, uh, because uh, so this, this illustration may be familiar with some of you who worked on plant nutrition. Yeah? So this is basically the, the water in this barrel here is the usefulness of our model. Yeah? And of course, the model is only going to be as useful as the shortest stave of this barrel. Yeah? So if we have all the information in the world on input availability or photosynthesis or whatever, we may still not be doing something useful if we neglect the markets. That is basically the idea. Um, <clears throat> We model the system using all sources of information, our primary data if we have some, but also the local knowledge, the expert knowledge. And we explicitly consider uncertainties about everything. Now, because we may not have perfect knowledge, but we can bracket ranges. We can come up with distributions that describe our state of knowledge. I don't know what the price of wheat next year, but I can give you an upper and a lower limit that I'm pretty reliable. Uh, so this this is we have to make use of this more i think so-called bayesian approach we don't have to have precise knowledge as long as we can describe our uncertainty or prior beliefs so to say um, and then we identify key uncertainties based on our analysis here pieces of information we really need and we need to collect as scientists and we update the model whenever we get more information and here's the process uh, that we usually apply. So we have a decision, we become decision focused researchers, and we do a holistic participatory decision analysis. That's how we usually start. It involves decision makers and it involves farmers, often or stakeholders, uh, and academic experts as well. So we try to collect all the information we can get and develop a model together an impact model of the decision options that somebody considers. And we parameterize this, we feed it with the state of the knowledge as we summarize it based on literature and all kinds of things. And also so-called calibrated experts, because we have an enlightenment process, where we teach people to estimate their uncertainty. And it's a learnable skill, it's pretty fascinating. Um, but we can, we can make people good estimators and actually enable them to estimate what they already know. And if we have this, we can run simulations, we can forecast outcomes for different decision options. And often, even if we have lots of uncertainty, it's clear what the preference and what the recommendation is. If the preference is clear, we make a recommendation. If not, then we identify knowledge gaps and <clears throat> we um, do some research and then we update the model and then um, or basically do this until we can make a recommendation. So this is this is the challenge and this is the process here. And that's one I want to show you one quick example of how we've done it and it will be done soon. <laughs> and uh, so this one, this example was uh, actually from a student from that master's program that I just, just mentioned earlier, who um, <clears throat> who worked in worked in Oman. She's now in, uh, in Vietnam. She's now a PhD student with me, so that track sometimes works out. So she worked on agroforestry adoption and did an ex ante evaluation of various agroforestry options. As I said, agroforestry is complex. And there's tons of things we could be looking at: all the trees and the crops and the animals and the interactions and the light. And the water and the nutrients and all kinds of things you can spend a career on one system uh, but this doesn't really help anyone make decisions <laughs> and we're also not going to have the level of detailed knowledge that maybe a monocrop modeler can have because it is more complicated of course they can't mean that the, the monocrop modeler can work for 10 years and have a solution and we have to work for a thousand years because before we can make any recommendations in agroforestry that can't be the solution <laughs> Uh, so we have we need pragmatic ways of modeling such systems. I think the same holds for regenerative agricultural systems and in many other settings, by the way. Uh, so this is the region here, northern Vietnam, and basically we have different agroforestry options here. Um, I don't want to go into detail here. Different combinations, often of maize and tree crops. And this is what they look like here. And uh, Hua has set, uh, set down and, and developed a decision analysis workflow. So this is basically well, it's different representation, but roughly the same thing that I just showed you. She sat down with the farmers, um, talked about their perspective. She sat down with the advisors. Yeah, so an agricultural scientist, of course, as you know, has to be comfortable in both environments, uh, in the field with your feet in the mud, in the farmer's home, and also possibly on a bigger stage at some point, a cleaner stage with other the, um, suit-wearing people. 
Um, and she made a decision model. And it's not very complicated at the high level. It's a bit more under the surface, but not so much. But you see that many aspects are involved here. We have the tree yields and the crop yields, and we have the risks that are involved, and all of those things that people really gave her as inputs. All the things that, that, that play a role had to be included here and are explicitly captured in the model. Yeah, so this is the impact model that involves all the costs and the benefits and the risks and the risks of doing this complex intervention and it's informed by thoroughly characterized states of knowledge yeah, so there was this calibration procedure that I just hinted at and we really tried to capture the, 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 the distributions plausible ranges of all of these variables that that are involved and that allowed us allowed us to run simulations um, I don't have a working point here, so I'm not going to talk too much about this but in the first column here you see the distributions always of the maize monoculture, so the current status quo, which is environmentally really problematic in a, in a hilly landscape. And then the other distributions are always the, the agroforestry systems. And what's shown in these figures is the profit prospects. And we see, you can see that in all cases, even with all this uncertainty, we could say that agroforestry in the long run is the better option. This is always what, what, what seemed most beneficial. We also found key, key information gaps, however, that are still, still limiting. And you can see this in the, the other columns. It's a little bit difficult to see, maybe, for some of you. But one of the constraints has been the discount rate, which is this abstract concept that most of us, everyone knows what it means, is that basically that we'd like to have money in the pocket today rather than 10 years from now. Yeah? People have a, a, there's a time preference for money, especially for poor people, of course. We need money now to feed our family. We can't wait for 10 years until the trees are big. Yeah, so important to keep in mind, it emerges as an important knowledge gap and a few other things too. But you see the outcome expectations of all the options are quite quickly available. We didn't do a lot of detailed research or a 10-year project. We could basically decide already. Um, and all agroforestry options look better, but they require this initial investment. That's always a bit of an issue in, the, in many of the sustainable systems that we have in mind. This, by the way, is one of the main reasons why people aren't doing these things. It's expensive and they actually have to forego income in the short run, even though things will be more profitable in the long term. So we could use we can use this now to, to advertise this practice to the government of Vietnam, for example, or to some local NGO and say, this is great, or maybe even to the farmers. Uh, so we have something now that summarizes everything that we needed to know about the system. We haven't only found out, oh, there are more microbes here under the tree than there. That's great to know, uh, but it's not actually going to help any decision maker. Yeah, so this is a business case that can be used for this purpose. We get indications for intervention design. Again, we have this initial investment thing here. So if you're, if you're an NGO and you want to promote under agroforestry, you better have some cash available to support things in the first, in the, the short term. Maybe farmers can pay that back later on. I don't know, but you have to help them overcome this initial barrier. And we have been able to identify high value variables, some knowledge gaps that are actually worth researching. And most of us, most researchers out there, they, they jump on the first knowledge gap that comes their way, no matter if it's important for a decision maker or for the big picture. So here we have a strategic way of identifying these knowledge gaps and figure out what's, what's worth focusing on. Uh, so agroforestry looks very promising here, but we need more, inform more information about the yields of various crops and we need interventions that support farmers with initial investments. So it's basically the conclusion here. So wrapping up, becoming a system scientist, what am I trying to say? Um, we have to acknowledge that agricultural systems are complex. Uh, the solutions are likely complex and the process of evaluating possible solutions is also complex. Uh, we have to develop an ambition, and you probably all have this to some extent, we have to develop, to develop an ambition to understand this complexity. Don't try to make it too easy even though, in, even though your research training may incentivize you to make it easy. It's not that easy, and we shouldn't pretend like it is, at least not totally forget that it isn't so easy. <clears throat> Don't focus too narrowly, at least not only. Again, quick, um, side note, I once had, a, had, a, had the um, privilege of talking to the chair of our department in back in California, and he gave me some advice on career, and the advice was basically, you're too broad, specialized because think about what are you going to be if you're going to be a professor what are you going to be a professor in and for ever since that day i wonder if if he had a point or not 
Yeah. Then we discussed less too much, and the professor now was it his luck or whatever. Yeah? I don't know. And so I'm, I'm, I'm careful with this advice. Otherwise, people will give you the opposite advice. But don't specialize only. Yeah? At least keep your eyes open to the broader perspective. If you feel like you've, um, you don't understand anything at any point in your career, know that this is normal. Yeah, unless you've just walked into a totally new space, it's probably just a stage of learning. In agriculture, I think everyone who tries to understand system, the complex systems gets to that point at some point. If you do, don't give up. Agriculture may still be for you. You've just made it to the next stage, which might be the most depressing time of your life. But it passes, <laughs> it passes, and then you get through it, hopefully. Just keep reading and keep studying. Um, consult widely with farmers, with stakeholders, and decision makers. Yeah? Look for the connections there and talk to them. What do they actually need? Um, learn to assume different perspectives. I think that's pretty important, not only the farmer's perspective, by the way, because farmers are often not very innovative and only often very interested in, in keeping doing what they're doing. Yeah? So also, also look at other perspectives, also talk to environmentalists who may have also have unrealistic ideas, but try, try to be the person who understands different points of view. Um, consider, the, consider the impact pathway. Yeah? So if there's one thing you take away from this, think about impact. How do you actually get to where you want to be and what needs to happen? What are the steps that need to happen? Whose behavior needs to change? Who needs to know what, you, what you're doing? And how can you get them involved? It may have something to do with, so I've, I've opened a Twitter account at some point realizing that I need to communicate better. I'm terrible at this, as you can still follow me tonight. Um, but I mean, think about your communication strategy and, and the way you're reaching that audience that needs to, needs to be involved. And if you formalize this, you feel free to check out our decision analysis approach. I'm excited about it. I think it's cool. Um, here's some links that you can read. Uh, so in theory, we could possibly now find, find this information. I, I think it's nice and, and it's, it's, worth, it's worth checking out because there's a lot to offer that in this. And that's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kuzmi. Yeah, we uh, we we learned a lot. I I discovered uh, what a what a what a good uh, yeah cropping scientist is, and that I indeed uh, yeah have to be interdisciplinary and uh, yeah not always be a specialist. And I hope that uh, that is also something we will all discover here. We all have our backgrounds uh, and ideas, but stay open, be interdisciplinary. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for the, this presentation. And uh, yeah, for now there is this some time and room to go back to the place where you uh, already started doing uh, the cookies and uh, drink the drinks. They were meant for now, but no worries. Um, yeah, we were uh, we will have the um, uh, workshops and trainings starting in half an hour from now. If you haven't done already, uh, you can sign up but there is a maximum of, of here to 15 persons per training um so yeah it will not fit all of you but for those that will, where it will not fit for uh, you can uh, yeah network a bit do whatever you want and uh, it's also nice uh, surroundings here and so we can also go for a walk i know a good place to, to, to have a nice view um so yeah that's it then the trainers will will come uh pick you up at the um yeah at, at the, the place where we'll have our drinks a little break so yeah that's uh, the first formal part of this uh, uh this event later tonight we will uh, uh yeah at the world cafe where we will start more brainstorming and so keep an eye on, on the whatsapp for the, the latest updates and yeah feel free to, to have a drink Again, and uh, then let's, and uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> which, yeah, you had to, yeah, give, uh, give up which train you were interested in. Yeah, that's something uh, they will, they will come up with the list of, uh, of participants. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I also got some questions from online. If uh, we can share a presentation, 
So uh, yeah, if that's possible, then uh, yeah, we will make it available and send it to the yeah, your email addresses. And also for those uh, watching online, we will make sure that it, uh, it comes uh, to your email address. And if you are watching online and haven't registered yet, you only get this one link. You have to check on our website to register so we know how to send it to you. Okay, other questions? No? All right. Then uh, let's, uh, let's have a drink outside. Yeah, I can uh, safely remove the, uh, the uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe you want to reduce the size of the images. I see. Massive. I see. Yeah. 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 Just a quick idea that I had. Maybe you can like just put like a, a Google document and then like just share the link so everybody who's interested can download it themselves in the end. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just that's a good idea. Yeah. Might be something that's yeah. really easier than yeah. sending like all the emails. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll make one folder on Drive. And, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. Might, that might be handy. Yeah. Like keeps you doing a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Stop. Yeah, yeah, no worries. No worries. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd say maybe we're kind of been focusing on the process more than the I mean, we do implement it. It's actually difficult to get into the places where this really can make a difference. We mm -hmm. have a concrete intervention. But the idea has actually been to use the models we developed uh, for, for guidance initially, but also for monitoring and evaluation. Right? So you can basically look at what the expectations were. And from year to year, you basically update your model a bit more and see, see if you're still on track. So that I think it, it has potential for that, but it hasn't really happened yet. Okay, there's yeah. a few proposals on it, but it's not. Yeah, because I was wondering, I was like, oh, yeah, maybe a few of them. But I, I kind of get that people focus a lot on developing the model. Yeah, but it's, it's ultimately about partnerships. And now here we're in Germany, it's kind of far away from the, from the, where the action is. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, Makes sense. sometimes a bit difficult. <laughs> yeah, but thank I, I think you. it has potential for it. I, I think that's so I because uh, I'm that the world of artists is actually Kenya yeah, works the more as well. Okay. And uh, in my country, uh, the uh, artist is no like here in Nicaragua. So, but I hear towards specialized things. Um, yeah, but the, the, the thing is, I, I find that developing agricultural or agricultural models, right, uh, in theory, makes me and yes, developing uh, Ryan. Maybe joining online. Sure, of course. <laughs> I was going. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Great, great. Great to see you there. Yeah, it's sure. a nice EIS logo. I'm following every every of your steps. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's going well here. Yeah, it's true, but I mean, I think our idea but the, uh, to the picture of the video was, uh, uh, we have this, was not this highlighted, but we will figure it out later. Temptation of implementing yeah. something without actually having thought through the, uh, I will mute myself. I think it's still too loud there, but uh, thanks everyone.